it is difficult to imagine the horror and the fear and the reality of what it was like to heading towards a target when the flak is up, when the searchlights are up, when the fighters are up, when you're watching your friends literally explode around you, when you're watching a Lancaster over there explode. Arthur Joplin was one of those brave Lancaster pilots, a member of legendary 617 Squadron. Well, I was very fortunate to have a very good crew and that, that made all the difference. <laughs> the pilots only one part of the team. Now, at 93, his mind plays a few tricks on him at times. He struggles to remember what it was like to fly a Lancaster. Well, I'm very sorry, but I, I can't recall. I, it was just a, I don't know, it was an aircraft. And that's what happened. You know, we, it was an aircraft and we sat in the right places and, as a crew and that's what we do, we flew it. But there is something that remains vivid and still haunts him. Well, I was broken hearted, they both got killed and um, that's been a big tragedy for me forever. As you will discover, Arthur judges himself and was judged harshly. But the facts discovered since reveal a very different story. He's the epitome of bravery, the epitome of courage, the epitome of honour and decency. And I know that Arthur will be shouting at me saying, don't be ridiculous, John. Uh, because he would say, I'm just doing my duty. John Nickel understands air combat. We're flying the aircraft at about 15 feet. We're flying the aircraft at 650, 700 miles an hour. He was an RAF navigator in a tornado fighter bomber shot down over Iraq. He was captured, beaten, tortured, and pictured around the world. You are your 15 squadron. Now he's a military commentator and author. It is not until you get into a Lancaster until you fully understand what it was like. You imagine, because it looks like a giant bomber, that it is a giant inside, and it is not. And when the flak is coming up, uh, when the flak is rattling through the sides of the aircraft, when there's smoke, when there's fire, when the aircraft's out of control, that would be a horrific tube of aluminium to be in. Arthur flew nine operations before the crash that nearly killed him, bombing the very heart of Germany. We were destroying the German cities, the Germans' ability to wage war. So perhaps if you look at a city like Hamburg, maybe 40,000 or so people killed in that city. Munich, tens of thousands killed. Bremen, tens of thousands killed. Cologne, tens of thousands killed. In all the skies of Europe at war, one squadron only is flying. Arthur was a member of the elite 617 squadron, the Dam Busters. Enemy coast to hand. You are with the Dam Busters in action, boring a T-top height into the heart of the Third Reich. He joined after the famous raid. You were put in the big room with a whole lot of navigators and bomb aimers and flight engineers, and you were kind of left to yourself to sort yourself out as a crew. So you didn't really know anyone much, and you just more or less made friends of the RAF people that you were working with. They could afford to take on the best crews who were going to be able to take on the challenges. The challenges of navigation, the challenges of bomb aiming, the challenges of finding their way to a specific target. Uh, the Krems Barrage was one of the very difficult targets right on the border of Switzerland. Peter Wheeler is an expert on Kiwis who flew with Bomber Command. Arthur's crew scored a direct hit. And in fact, his target photo appeared in the Times the following day. And they were very, very proud of that. And so to hit um, something as narrow as a dam, I mean, it's only 20 yards wide, from 19,000 feet with a bomb is pretty good going. After briefing in the cold November dawn, 29 Lancasters race along the runway. 
Loaded with 12,000 pound bombs, the planes climb toward the North Pole to hunt the 45,000 ton Tirpitz. One of the prime targets of the war, the pride of the German fleet, Hitler's prized battleship, the Tirpitz. I think Churchill called it the beast or something, but I, I, I never knew it like that. It was just, just surface to me anyway. And uh, that was it. An earthquake bomb bursts on the shore, but three others hit the turpits fore, aft, and amidships. We dropped our bomb and we un understood that it turned over and sank. Below in Tromso Fjord, as the Tirpitz keels over, shrouded in smoke, the shadow of Nazi conquest shrinks from the north. The target photo shows this bomb exploding about 200 yards away from the Tirpitz on the shoreline. And today you can still see Arthur's bomb hole in the beach. Uh, it's well photographed, it's quite famous. But those successes came at a heavy cost for the crews of Bomber Command. You're coming towards a 50-50 chance, just slightly less than an evens chance of being killed if you served in Bomber Command. Can you imagine that today? That now would bring down a government. Back then, this was just part of the conflict. You had to have luck in the Air Force, otherwise you wouldn't have got back. I mean, you had to have skill too, but I mean, luck played an important part. Arthur's luck ran out, returning from a long-range operation over Poland. One of 40 Lancasters desperately low on fuel, in heavy fog, trying to find a runway. Fog, which may shroud the fields of England for many days and nights of the year's four winter months, is a terrible and menacing threat to any aircraft flying from that country. They had petrol lines along the main runway and they set the petrol alight to burn the fog off so you had a clear runway. So an aircraft coming into a Fido airfield could probably see a glow above the clouds and then descend down and hopefully reach clear air about 100 feet above. And that sometimes happened, but not always. And we were coming down on that, and I'm not too sure what happened, but we didn't make it, unfortunately. They didn't have enough fuel to go anywhere else, and unfortunately, they came down. Um, into the into the field, and of course crashed. Yeah, I couldn't cope with the conditions, evidently, and I didn't. Unfortunately, very unfortunately. Two of his crew died in the crash, and he's blamed himself ever since. Oh, the crash! That's, that's the biggest thing. I, it, it's still a, a memory to me. You know, it's it's always with me. Arthur has always believed he was the only one to crash that day. Now, 73 years later, he's about to find out the truth. During that period, nine aircraft crashed in the fog and couldn't find their bases. Some of them crashed on approaching their bases, others crashed outside of it. Um, in fact, one poor crew simply vanished. And we think the poor souls just flew across cloud covered England and flew off into the Atlantic and disappeared entirely. There were nine aircraft that had accidents and 21 crew members were killed. 21? That's a lot of people. And all this time you believed you were the only one? I thought so, yes. I'd never heard of anyone else, you see, so I took it. It was that I was, that I was the only one. 
because others have crashed now, it's a relief to know I wasn't the only one who was caught by the weather. But from what I gather, we should not have been brought back. I think that was there was some understanding of when, we, when we left that we were going to go to Scotland. We was clear. And then somewhere along the line, on the way back, we were told to go report back to base. It was quite a tragedy that the saving grace, of course, is the majority of the aircraft um, supposedly disobeyed orders and headed north. But as it's said that had those aircraft returned back to England, they would have smacked into the ground all over Lincolnshire and there would have been a complete tragedy. Well, I just uh, um, wrote to Basil to thank him for saving me. Arthur almost died that night, saved by his heroic navigator, Basil Fish. When we, when we crashed on that night, um, the aircraft burst into flames and I was in the, in the front, you know, in the cockpit seat and I had both legs broken and Basil pulled me out of the burning aircraft. Arthur was very badly smashed up, broken ankles in both, both legs, hip, um, and he dragged him out. Basil dragged him out of the wreck and he said as he dragged him out, he heard the crunching and the snapping and grouching of bones. He, he was pretty brave to go into a burning aircraft to pull somebody out, you know. It's, at least I would, I would think so. I wish I had had the courage. Of it. I hope I would have the courage to do it. It's a similar thing, you know. For his services to his country, to the Allied Air Forces, Arthur would finish his operational career with a red endorsement in his logbook. In effect, the blame. I think it was a big, big, big shock to me that I'd got the endorsements, but that's what happened, you know, and you just took it as it as, 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 as came, sort of thing. It was the fault of the system that sent him off on operations, knowing that when they returned, there was going to be nowhere to land and that they were near to running out of fuel. So his red endorsement was a travesty of justice, an absolute travesty and a stain uh, on Bomber Command's reputation and in a stain on their treatment of the brave crews who fought for them. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.